This program is brought to you by Emory University. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Cardiovascular Grand Rounds. Um, I would say this morning's speaker doesn't need an introduction, and he told me that himself, but I'm going to introduce him anyway. Um, it is a real pleasure to have really one of our great educators and clinicians speak with us today, Dr. Doug Morris, who is the J. Willis Hurst Professor of Medicine. And I'm sure all of you know Doug uh, is originally a Dukie, uh, undergraduate at Duke, um, did his medical school at Baylor, his intern residency at Vanderbilt, and did his cardiology training here at Emory. And like many of us, has been a lifer, has spent his entire professional career here at Emory, and is, is as I said, well known as a, a master educator and a master clinician and educator. He's uh, won, you know, Atlanta top doc for probably as many years as we could count, has been received numerous education awards uh, from both residents and fellows, and is one speaker I always look forward to hearing. He's always uh, got something interesting, and he's got a blank sheet to tell us about today. He's no, no hints on even the title. Dr. Morris, welcome. <coughs> Thank you, Bob. Your introduction is most gracious. And what we will do is, this is what we're looking at. And as I said, the title of my talk is Pursuing a Mystery. And I hope that after 45 minutes or so of discussion that, that you will agree that this is mysterious. Uh, some of you might not agree and might tell me the answer to the mystery, but let's go forward from this point. First, I want to show you there's, there's one, two, three, four, five patients. Patient number one is a young woman with a history of acute rheumatic fever presenting with exertional dyspnea. Number two is a 55-year-old man that awakened with severe PND and had a new onset of a systolic murmur. He'd never had a systolic murmur before in his life. Three is a 87-year-old male with no energy, feels poorly, has exertional dyspnea. Four, 52-year-old male with diabetes, and a smoker, presents with rather typical exertional angina. And a six, number five, a 65-year-old hypertensive male with new onset of atrial fib. Now, of all the trainees here, I want to ask you, you've got the nursing supervisor of the clinic comes to you and one of your patients didn't show up in clinic that day. And so they said, we need for you to see one of these people. You've got, you've got a gap in your schedule and we'd like for you to see one of them. So which one would you like to see? How many of you would prefer to see number one? Okay, how many would prefer to see number two? Okay. How many prefer to see number three? How many prefer to see number four? None, some of you don't want to see anybody. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's make a case. You know, there's it's no wrong or right here. Uh, make a case for, let's start over. How many want to see number one? Okay, nobody. Number two? Okay, four of you. Number three? Nobody. Number four? Okay, a couple. Number five. Okay, we're still not seeing. But at any rate, uh, I want to take note of that, and we'll go forward and come back to it from, from here. So we're going to look at that patient, the 87-year-old man. He presents for follow-up. He has weakness, easy fatigability, and exertional dyspnea. His recent problems include anemia with a hemoglobin between 10.8 and 11.2, he has a weight loss from 158 to 140 over two years. He's lost 10 pounds in the last six months. He has coronary heart disease dating back to 1998. He has a systolic murmur, and I say here mitral gurge, but it's maybe not clear. He has a systolic murmur. He has hypertension. And you've got to think about, this guy's got numerous problems. Which of these am I going to, to try to work on? And which am I going to try to work on first? One thing it was thought about is that they thought, well, this person has, as you look back, has this easy fatigability, he is anemic. I wonder if this patient's losing blood. And so he went through and had endoscopy and colonoscopy, had some mild esophagitis. They thought maybe due to some aspirin he was taken with his coronary disease and had some diverticulosis. No evidence of blood loss. He went and had 
his blood work done for anemia and came out with atypical findings. There was nothing here that said he had a macrocytic anemia, had iron deficiency anemia, had the anemia of chronic disease. It was kind of a hodgepodge of things. And so they said, well, we better get a bone marrow biopsy. And he comes out with a cellular marrow with no evidence of dysplasia. He makes a comment, he says, in talking to him, he says, I play golf for exercise. And his wife turns and says, you hadn't played in three years. And he also made the comment, when I retired, I lost all my joy, which really struck you at the time. Now let's go through and look at a couple of those things. Anemia, it was unexplained. Symptoms that limited him on exertion, it was unexplained. And so we've got to say, where do we go? And he had endoscopy that was negative in a bone marrow that didn't give any answers to his anemia. The striking thing is you look at our elderly population, about 10% of people living in the community, and these are people over 65, that means they're not in any type of nursing facility, are anemic. And when you get above 85, this increases to about 20%, a significant jump. It's more common in men than women, and it's particularly more common in blacks. What's the pathogenesis of this? Well, you can look and you see that a third of them have no cause. This is the NHAMES data. They have no cause for the anemia. There are some that have nutritional problems, B12, folate. Some have renal disease. A significant number have chronic inflammation. But a big number have no explanation. The other thing you also look at is that you tie that those people that are anemic have a higher death rate, have more profound problems with weakness, fatigue, and cognitive decline. Now, you have to recognize that this is epidemiological data and you can't say that there's a cause for it. You can't come out of here and say these people have anemia and they have these symptoms that are more likely to occur if they're anemic, but that doesn't mean that anemia is a cause. If you look at hypertension, you see that it climbs significantly. As you get into above 75, the vast majority of people are hypertensive. An interesting thing is you look at hypertension now, as you look at the SHEP data, says that a couple of things you need to know, and this is this ongoing battle of how low do you treat their blood pressure, get their blood pressure, that if you take the SHEP data and you lower the blood pressure down to less than 160, the stroke rate drops by a third. If you lower it another one down to 150, you drop another 5%. But there's no data that says that if you drop it lower than that, that you have a bad benefit in terms of stroke. Another thing that comes up is you've got to think about in the hypertensive people that are elderly is what about this diastolic pressure and should I pay any attention to that? That most of these people have systolic hypertension and don't have diastolic hypertension. In fact, the diastolic pressure might be low. And this is what has been referred to as the J-point curve. That is, if you look at the data and diastolic pressure, as you drop one down, you get down below 65, say, there's a reason to consider maybe I don't want to lower the systolic pressure anymore because I'm going to lower the diastolic further. Now, this is not clear. Again, like we said, the anemia of elderly, we don't know why it happens in a third of them, and we don't know real consequences of it. You go through the literature and you get about 20 different studies and about half of them say the J-point depression is something you need to pay attention to, and the other half say ignore it. And that's where we are with it. But it's something that I think needs to cross your mind when you're seeing the elderly patient come in with hypertension. The other data is you look at a SPRINT data, which has got a lot of attention. And the thing that's not given so much attention in my mind is the side effects of trying to drive that pressure down, particularly the elderly patient below 140. You look at this group in the SPRINT trial, which was older than, than, I mean, older than 65, but not reached 80, that they had a high incidence of side effects as you tried to press that blood pressure lower. So I think that that's something you need to decide about. The other thing is you know, and you see this man coming in with dyspnea, particularly exercise limitations, you say, well, is he in heart failure? And again, you recognize that if people are over 80 years of age, at least 75% of them have 
preserved, EF preserved heart failure. And the question is, is how do we treat this heart failure? And I'll come back to that as we go forward. One thing that's important and people are asking about is if we try to treat the heart, are we miss, are missing the boat? Is it the peripheral mechanisms that are reducing the cardiac output in these patients, such as a stiff vessel, such as inadequate dilatation in your skeletal muscles? And do we really have anything except some diuretics to offer these people that have preserved EF hypertension. The thing that I think is important to recognize is that clearly EF preserved hypertension is more common in women. Now this might be because women are outliving the men and men don't get to an age that they will see this. We also recognize though that aging is much more important than in the preserved hypertension group, preserved EF, than it is in the reduced EF. Urinary loss, albumin loss is also a factor that you might look at. But if you took this guy and said, how am I going to diagnose his problem with the exertional dyspnea, and you do a BNP and it's normal, and you don't see any elevated neck veins, and you come back and you say, does he still have reduced output? The systolic murmur is important. And the most common reason that elderly people have a systolic murmur is because their aortic valve is getting stiff and sclerotic. But always remember, if you look at aortic stenosis in the elderly, it's more likely to be a tricuspid valve that's become very rigid than it is that of a fused leaf that's usually associated with a bicuspid valve. So always think about, yeah, most common reason for a murmur in the elderly is Aortic, aortic sclerosis as you go forward with it. Now another thing that you look at, if you said, if somebody came and asked you, what is mitral regurgitation, maturity onset mitral regurgitation, what is it? Jane, do you know what it is? Maturity onset mitral regurgitation is what? And it's what they're asking is, what is the mitral regurgitation that happens as we get older? No? What are the etiologists? You can call on one of your colleagues again. What's that? Well, the most com two most common reasons that you think about it, and you get in a middle aged person who gets mitral regurgitation, is one ischemia, papillary muscle ischemia. And then the second one is a myxomalous valve with ruptured cordy. And those are two things that happen in the middle age. Now that's not the thing that happens in the elderly patient. The elderly patient has something else happen. And how does, if you look at this, this is the way our mitral valve is, is shaped. You see, the vast majority of the valve is covered by the posterior leaflet. The smaller part is covered by the anterior leaflet. But the leaflet tissue is about the same. But in the elderly, there is something that happens to the mitral valve that's important, and that is you get a calcified annulus. And that's what you were talking about. And it, it comes back and gets into the very elderly. What part of the valve calcifies? All that covered by the posterior leaflet. The portion covered by the anterior leaf that has no annular tissue. So there's nothing here that can calcify. This calcifies. Now if you say, how does mitral annulus, what role does it play in making the mitral valve competent? What does it do to make the mitral valve competent? That's right. Oh, thank you. It squeezes in. The annulus contracts. The annulus is not a stable structure. The part that contracts is that portion covered by the posterior leaflet. The portion covered by the anterior leaflet does not contract again because there's no annular tissue. So in the very elderly, what causes mitral regurgitation is calcified mitral annulus. And therefore, as it gets calcified, it can no longer contract. But again, remember that this is not likely ever to cause a valve that needs to be replaced. 
because mitral annular calcification doesn't usually bring severe mitral regurgitation on. But it's again just to think of something about the elderly. So, we went through and looked at this elderly man and said he could have problems. He could have problems with his mitral valve. He certainly could have problems with heart failure. Preserved, he has heart failure. He's got an anemia that's playing a role in something we don't know how much of an it is. And so you come and look at this, and this is the problem that we're seeing, is that you see as we age, and we start out, and the first few decades of our life is one of increasing maturity, increasing physical strength, increasing cognitive function. And then, unfortunately, we reach an age here that it begins to decline. This is a more graphic example of what aging is. This is another thing that's striking, though, and I think for all you young people to be aware of this, 10,000 baby boomers a day are reaching that old age, are reaching the point of cardiac where we begin to see the cardiac consequences of elderly, if you look at that. The other striking thing is you follow these graphs, and this is the people that are age 65 plus, these are the people that are age less than five years, that by 2030, there will be more 85-year-olders than five-year-olders. That means you young group better learn about these things of the elderly. Be taking care of myself and some of the rest of us. This is a striking thing. Is over the last decade, prior to this one, by our medical education, by our medical facilities, and by our public health measures, we improve survival by 30 years. That's a dramatic thing, but now what we're facing is we're facing the consequences of this. Is that, yeah, we've improved life, but we've got these people around and we've got to deal with them. And the one thing is I've brought about dealing with them is exactly what happened when I showed you those first pages of first patients. Nobody wanted to see the 87 year old. And there is, is that they don't have a lot of interesting findings. They say, we're all taught med school, find a chief complaint. Most elderly come in, and they don't have one chief complaint. They have 15 chief complaints. If you bring them into the waiting room, it takes you longer to get them situated into a room. They have to have some attendant usually to help them get in a gown, get up on the table. And so they're not as much fun to see. But they're a big population. But... That's not what I'm talking about. That on this people, group of people, the elderly, there's another group that have a grim prognosis. And that is their mortality over the next three years is six times higher than the rest of the elderly patients. And this is what we call frailty. And this is what we need to talk about it. And this is a mystery. And I'll tell you through this. As you look at presence of frailty, and you look over at age 65, about 70% will be frail. If you look over 80 years, about 30% of people over 80 will be frail. Now, let me make one point. is that Most 80-year-olders are very happy with their life and not looking for anything and don't need any help. But there's a significant group there that do. Other figures, and again, this is from a cardiovascular health study, says that these are the numbers that you see. And you might put them on a graph like this. And it said, everybody know, those of us that will live to 100 or even live to 96 and above, will, all of us will be frail. That 100% as you, you track humanity, that you, by the time you reach that age, you reach frailty. But there's a group that began to reach it much earlier. What is frailty? Well, several def definitions. One is a, you can say it's an exhaustion, weakness, weight loss, loss of muscle mass. Another more grim thing is a period of life devoid of full function and dignity and lacking total independence. That is, people reach a state of life that they're no longer independent. Another one is it's a generic syndrome that embodies an elevated risk of catastrophic decline. That is, that these people can be going along and then something happens and 
the bottom falls out. There are physiological impairments that go along with it. Let's say this, there is a face to frailty. That part of the thing has happened in the last decade, there was a like, up until the last decade, there were maybe 25 papers in the literature about frailty. In the last decade, there have been over 2,000 written looking at it and trying to figure out what happens with it. And there is a face to it. One, it could be your grandmother or your, even your mother or your elderly aunt. Could be the guy next door. But it also could be a former president of the United States. He, of course, is deceased. If you see any pictures of George Bush now, you usually see him in a wheelchair with Barbara pushing him. And he's clearly in decline. This guy, when he reached the papacy, was the most active, fit person that had ever been in that position. By the time he died, he was a very frail individual that needed help doing everything. This is a guy that made the news because at age 90, he decided that he was dying quickly and his wife, nobody would be there to take care of her, so he killed her before he died. And that, of course, made the news. But that's the face of frailty that we're seeing today. Now, this is what the problem is. If the first group of people I talked about was the elderly, they were not frail. They were just the elderly. They reached age. And then you got the frailty. And I thought of a wonderful quote by Churchill. It says, when nature, nature never draws a line without smudging it. And that means that there's not, you can't stand here and say, absolutely, there's a clear distinction between being just elderly and being frail. The part of the question we have is, how do you find frailty? And this is one of the criteria. And it says three or more things have to occur. And it has to be weakness, exhaustion, weight loss, low physical activity, low gait speed. And that is that these people come into your office and you've got to decide. And that's what's facing us now is trying to decide who is frail and deciding as we get more procedures we can do percutaneously, like TAVR. It used to be there's no question whether you decide somebody went to aortic valve replacement because they knew they were going through an operation. Now when they can do it percutaneously, it becomes a more difficult question of saying, it's not a question of them providing, dying, I mean, living through the procedure. The question is, is 30, 60, 90 days, are they any better than they would have been without the procedure? The problem with this type of definition is that it's predominantly physical, and so it's hard for some people to even undergo the test. Another way is they have a list of 79 different features, and you check off the ones that the person has. You know, like they cannot stand from a seated position or cannot walk a certain distance or something like that. You check them off, and they get a percentage of the number of factors that predict that they're frail. And as you reach a certain number, then you describe as being frail. This is a time-consuming thing, and most people don't use it because it takes so long to do. And then there's another seven-point frailty test that just goes through. And the problem with this one is it's very subjective. And that's where we are most of the time with frailty today. Is we use the eyeball test. We kind of look at them from the end of the bed and say, this patient looks frail, it doesn't. And we don't give any, any further credence to it. The best single test, that, and this is... Generally uniform, people have done this. The best single test is a walking test. If you want to decide somebody is frail. And there's several different ways of doing a walking test. One way is you just put 15 meters out. And Ted Johnson has an app on his thing that he's developed along with some other people to do this. And you just have them walk at 15 <coughs> feet. Another one, a little more sophisticated, have them sit in a chair. No arms on the chair. You have to rise from that position and walk 15 feet and then turn around because when you turn, that takes in the component of balance that they begin to lose and walk back. And then this one that's depicted up here is the most aggressive test. Any way you want to use it, people are saying this is the single best test for doing it. But what I'm posing to you is you need to think about these things. We're no longer at the point that we just dismiss the elderly patient. And how many of us have ever thought about doing this with most of our early patients? I'd say very few. One thing to remember is frailty is not the same as having a disability. It's not the same as having some comorbid condition. 
It's different. If somebody comes in and has a knee replaced or has a hip replaced, they have a, a disability you hope they'll recover from, but that doesn't mean that they're frail. Now, what I'm going to try to do is show you a couple of things I made up to, to show you what I see is what's happening with frailty. Probably the basic part that starts off is a loss of muscle mass. Now, the one thing to realize when you're losing muscle mass, it doesn't mean your muscles have gotten smaller. They could be the same size, but they've lost their strength, their contractility, because they're being replaced with fibrous tissue. But it starts with that, and you hit a low muscle mass. Then the patient begins to get decreased physical activity because it takes them longer to do. Now, the problem you have, have is, did this come before that? Or is this a consequence side? You also begin to get an increased risk of fall. They begin to lose their autonomy and they begin to become dependent on others. This is another way to look at it. Sarcopenia is thought to be that, and that's just reduced muscle strength, and say that this is a physiological syndrome, and this is part of the problem with it, is that you can look at a lot of these people and come in, and they don't look frail to you. They look okay. And because what they do is they've never had any stress to it. As soon as you do something stressful to them, they crumble. Because they've lost all that reserve. And that's the hard part of trying to predict at this, is who we need to intervene on, or who we need to say, you don't need that surgery or that procedure. It's because they can look good, and what you're trying to do is do something to predict those people that lack that reserve. First thing they usually use, it loses their strength. Then they become exhausted. Then they decrease their activity level. Then they decrease their appetite. It is also called something of anorexia of elderly, that people, just as they get old, begin to lose their appetite. But together, this leads to weight loss. And it also, as I said, can be precipitated. If we look at it a different way, that these are the things that you need to do. If you want to measure strength. The routine way is that there's something called a hand grip thing that you can have in your office. That these patients can squeeze and you can get a good idea of their strength. You also can do a walking test, one of the three I talked about, and measure about their speed. Exhaustion, you really have to do nothing but depend on them or the family to say, as a patient says, as I try to do something I just feel totally exhausted. And then the weight loss, is that something clearly you can measure? So this is all trying to identify these people that have low reserve. This is what happens. You can have some people that are coming across and have a realistic assessment of them and say they're doing fine. You have another group here that's totally fit, same age, you can see what happens to them. This is just the elderly patient. They have something happen, have a slight decline in physical activity, quickly bounce back. You have this other group that's going along, not, you look over here, not totally independent, but there's not something that you recognize, and they cruise along, have something happen. Big deficit, takes them a long time to recover. There's another group that have a slow, steady decline, and nothing is happening to them, except they're losing their strength, becoming weaker. And then you have another group that go through a series, come in, URI, come in, have pneumonia, come in, maybe it's fine. And this is what they're asking us, is to try to say, boy, can you predict these, who these people are, and can you do something about it? This again, as you're talking about, person looks like they're good, have stress hit, have no reserve, although you couldn't pick it up until this happens, and then they're in dire need and need something to happen, something to happen. Now the question comes up is we've got this situation, and what's the cause of it? And that again is part of the mystery. Is it inflammation? And if there, there clearly is evidence of inflammation. A lot of times these people have a high CRP. You have, if you measure IL-6, it's going to be elevated. The question is, though, is that inflammation causing this illness or condition? I don't illness, I guess. 
It is a compensatory mechanism trying to help the patient recover from that, or is it an epiphenomenon? And there are evidence to support all of these things. Probably the most of the evidence is in favor of some type of inflammation. And as I said, we've talked about already the links of what role does anemia play, and how do you deal with anemia? And how far, part of the problem that you also go into seeing these people, like you take the patient I presented with first, came in with anemia, he got his blood work, that didn't pan out, he had a bone marrow biopsy, and the question you say, do we really need to go that far? I mean, and that's part of the finding that I see when you, these people come in and they're exhausted, they can't walk far. And you're trying to decide, is this really heart failure or is it just deconditioning? And it's, it's hard to come out with a number I find on these people. And all the time you come in and you tell them, well, we can't find anything, we think you're deconditioning, I need more exercise. You're in your mind saying, am I really sure of that? Some people have said frailty is a, patho is a, a cardiovascular condition. The reason they say that is it does more common in the obese person than the active person. They're more, less physically active. They frequently have an elevated hemoglobin A1C, higher incidence of smokers. And those people, I don't know what you think of it, but it's those people that have more likely abnormal ABIs, more likely to have frailty. This is the problem. This is the mysteries of this syndrome. First is, there is no consensus to define the characteristics. What are the true characteristics of this? And there's no consensus that says one, two, three, and four are the characteristics. There's also an absence of an agreed upon measure of severity. What can we all look at and say, this is what we say is severely frail, mildly frail, no, no agreement on that. And the other question is, there's no reliable means of predicting a prognosis. That is, if you have somebody come in and they're talking about having a procedure, if you get them, set them on an exercise program and bring them back in four months or six months, can you really improve them to the point that they can do the procedure? And that's, that's not clear. I think this is one thing we need to remember, is that when you're looking at trying to treat fairly, you're not trying to increase life expectancy. But we've got a major population of people that can't do live independently. That's what you're trying to improve, is how do we improve their, their life while they live it. <laughs> I think that this is another important part that you try to say, what are the components that we look at is, sometimes we forget it, but we as humans are social animals. And if you begin to, to move them and say, we're going to try to have you totally independent, and you think that that means that they can isolate and do things on their own, that's bad, that these people do need to be remain in a so, very social environment. These are a couple of things that we look at, in, in the, and I think that you talk about, as you look at and you have which lives matter in this world. I think they all do, but I think you also can say that a group that I think is overlooked is the elderly. And that's what we need to deal with. What are the tools that we need to do? I think this is some of the things that you need to do, is that you need to, to if you've got elderly patients, you need to have some type of way to assess whether they're frail or not. And you need to do some care planning. You know, and some of these people come out at one age and they're about to make a big commitment, financial or otherwise, and there needs to be some thought as to what their life expectancy is. You need to have some framework of activity or actions that are going to happen. If this happens to them, what is going to be <coughs> the medical response? We've got to be a better at doing this. And again, I think doing better at that, we've got to think about in our own mind, what is a program we can set up that if we identify somebody as ill, uh, frail, that we can do, help them with it. We also need to realize this, that you can look at some people that are very frail and their ability to adapt to this is not what we'd like for it to be. And then we need a better assessment of procedural operative risk. This is another factor that we need to think about as we deal with these people. 40% of people over 65 use more than five drugs a week. 12% use more than 10 medications a week. 
Now, if you go through and start looking at it, most of the studies had nobody in the 80s or 90s in them. So we don't know what they do. Now, some of the statins that recently have come out with a couple of studies, they looked at the 4S data, tried to pull out the very elderly in that, and looked at it, looked at it with pravastatin, and it looks like that with the statins, there's still some benefit even as you lose later, but they, that doesn't extend even with these studies into above 85 or so. And so these people coming in and you're trying to decide what medications you need, you need to give some thought to that. Again, and I would defer to my, my heart failure people, but uh, I'm always bothered by the, the ejection fraction preserved people with heart failure and say, how do we treat them successfully? I mean, in my mind, if you look at it, I know there's a one or two studies that say maybe ACE inhibitors and uh, angiotensin receptor blockers have some positive effect, but the bulk of the literature in my mind looks like it, there's no proof of that. I don't know. I will we'll ask Andy at the end what he thinks. So, so uh, the other interesting thing, though, that, that I'm impressed with is that physical activity is important. And I think it's important, even in these people with heart failure, that trying to get them, keep them mobile. What happens is people get into this syndrome, they go to sit on their sofa, they get in a chair, they quit moving, and they say, well, I'm too tired to move. And I think right now it's, it's imperative that we try to push them. All the data and all the frailty, if there's one thing that keeps coming up, is saying exercise is important. And even the people with heart failure, that we can try to get them to, to do it. And I think what happens is that Sometimes we try to apply an exercise program in the 80-year-older that we've been using it in the 40-year-older, and that's, that's incorrect. As we said, how about frailty and inflammation? Well, again, it looks like that uh, inflammation is important. Does that have a role in causing anemia or chronic disease? Uh, and what is, what is the effect? What we should do about the anemia? And the general rule is that EPO doesn't work. What happens is actually you can see that EPO might rise naturally in some of these elderly people, but the hemoglobin hematocrit doesn't rise with it. So it looks like if whatever is causing anemia is not on the basis of developing red cells, it's the red cells don't get released. Myeloplastic syndrome is, is common in these people. Again, generally you don't do anything about it. But that's another question. Is there something that we need to be doing about this? And EPO and IL-6 and NF kappa B of all been things that have been considered. This, I think, is a fairly good program where we start looking at this exercise. And that is trying to decide what are normal activities they're going to do, what are you going to do for strength, what are you going to do for flexibility. That is the things that I think that you need to look at in these elderly people or resistance training for the upper arms, aerobic training for the legs, balance training. And I think an important thing is to try to keep them active. And as I said, the hard thing about it, and you come in and you face this and you have somebody that's, that says they're exhausted and can't do anything, and try to get them to do something. And, they, and you're always in your mind saying, God, is there heart failure I'm missing? And I'm pushing them when they don't really feel like it. But, boy, I don't, I don't think we've got much choice to try to do this uh, to help them. And this is one thing that I've seen. I went over to actually the Y because somebody told me they had a program there and I wanted to see it. And, and this is the chair exercises. And for the elder to do, and, and it's a really impressive program. I mean, none of it is stuff that is overwhelming as you do it, but at the end of an hour, if they they have some positive benefit from it. And it's just a series of things. You first start out by using the chair for balance and doing things, and then you get out of the chair and you can sit down, such as this, and do stuff. So it's sit down in a chair exercise, then chair exercises for balance. And it's just a series of them, and I think I do. So, as I think you go through and look at this and say, Here's a couple, several people who run. One's a 75-year-old male that runs a 10K in 44 minutes. Pulse is 52, blood pressure is 150 over 70. BMP is 24, meds are naproxen, and a 12-statin and avidart. 
What would you worry about on this man? Anything? Yanni, what would you do? What's that? I think that's, no, I think that's right. I mean, first you start saying, he's on a naproxen, that bothers you, taking it, it could cause a reason for GI bleeding, <coughs> because of other things. You also wonder what he's, what he's trying to cover up with the naproxen. You do ask at 75, is a torvastatin really, really significant in him? Uh, and then you look at that blood pressure, 150 over 70, and you start saying, well, do I want it any lower than that? I think I'd be, be happy saying this thing. <coughs> How about the next one? 75 year old male enjoys playing checkers three times a week with friends of similar age. BMP is 29. You can see he's in atrial fib. Blood pressure is lowest. Refuses to exercise. You can see his medicines. What would you What would you do? Anybody? Well, I look at it and you say. I'm comfortable with the fact that he's got atrial fib and he's now on, on something to an anticoagulant, and that's good. You'd say, I really would like to get him to exercise, but you sure don't want to stop the checkers playing because that is a social endeavor that makes a big difference to this guy. And so you look at his, his antihypertensives and say, uh, yeah, do I need to be on as much as he's on? I mean, I'm down to 110 over 70. Uh, I might want to back off some of that. Not big things, but I think the things that you need, it's easy for these people to come in the office, you see them, you turn around, you send them out, and you think of nothing else about it. And the last one is a 75-year-old male that lives alone, has his meals brought in once a day, but BMI is 21, walks half a block, once showed up at the wrong house. I'd be worried about isolation. Yeah, absolutely. That, that is... That this is a thing that you better watch. This, this person of all of them is the one that is, is most scary. One, you've got isolation. Secondly, you're down. He's not exercising. He's, he's low weight. Uh, you've got problems. And, this, and then as you show, he showed up in the wrong house is his cognitive function beginning to fall. These are things that you need to think about as you, as you look at these people. One thing I wanted to... Oh, this is... Another thing that, that you'll hear, and you hear the uh, public will talk about this and say, I'm doing a crossword puzzle, I'm doing this or that, keep my mind sharp. This is under that esteemed uh, medical journal in New York Times. Uh, but what it's talking about is, and I think a, a good article, lady is, is head of the neurology program at, at National Institute of Health. And this is her thing, she's talking about that, uh, just they don't. There's no evidence that it works. That you know, there's not any anything wrong with it. But it, don't go and say that this is something that you got to start buying something extra to do that. And this is the question. This is the mystery of frailty. As I look at it, why do some people age well and others do not? And this is two examples. Seventy-five-year-old guy that runs 10k regularly. 75-year-old woman is having a struggle getting around even a walker. Why, why is this? Has this been totally dependent because he's tried to exercise and stayed active in his life? She hasn't. Is there something else? Other is how do we detect clinically silent frailty? And that's, that's the, probably the most difficult. How do you detect that person that comes in your office looking good Boy, he's just ready to crumble if something's imposed on him, some procedure. Another one is this, is you're only as old as you think you are, a wrong-headed cliche. What do people think? The data would say this is correct. The data would say that those people that stay active and continue to do things and take a positive approach in social endeavors and this thing, really do much better. And then the other one is, is it true that growing old may be inevitable, but growing frailty is not? 
And I don't know the answer to that one. That is, a lot of the data, as I said, says that we're all headed for frailty if we live long enough. But is that true? Can we do anything to abolish it? I think my key of, uh, and point of trying to do this is to get you to think about it. I don't come here with a lot of answers. I come here with still a, a mysterious thing going on, but it's, it's real. We've got to think about it. We've got to decide, do we need something in cardiology? Primary care is trying to do it. We need something in cardiology, some type of thing. If co people come in for their yearly checkup in Medicare that is paid for, that we have a certain number of things that are done for them are checked out, like hand grip, walking up in walking speeds, checking their weight, or is this something that we say, no, it's not our responsibility? I think these are the questions I'm posing out there. And then, as I said, I wish I could come to you and say, I know if you do this, it will solve the problem. So we'll leave it with this and the big wine, open it up for questions. Thanks. Our comments. I'd like to hear people's thoughts on this. As I said, I yeah, I mean, a very obviously a very pertinent issue for all of us. And um, so, the one thing that I think you had a hidden slide there that sort of heads towards that is the is the over sort of the overlaying issue of depression in the elderly, and and you know the relationship between that and frailty. And I, I think that's a that's you know something we don't pay enough attention to. We often miss it, you know, and and uh, you know, a lot of these patients put on a, a good show when they come to see you, uh, but in fact, you know, there's a, you know, an epidemic of, of depression in the elderly that I think plays into this a lot. I think that's a good point. As I said, I did have it in there and I said, well, it might be too much and I'll take it out, but it is. Like this one man, you see there, all this, and you say, well, could all that be not frailty, but just depression? And I was struck by the fact that he said, all the joy of my life left out when I quit working. Uh, and, um, and I think it is, a, is, is something we say and you're trying to, and most of us, at least I have to say myself, I shouldn't say most of us, are not really that comfortable using antidepressants. We don't use them a lot, but are we missing something? And should we have a, like this, there's a, there's a two patient, a two item questionnaire, there's of course the nine item questionnaire. Should that be filled out? Should that be part of our frailty? study that we do on these people and look at it and if there is obvious depression try to get them help uh, good point yeah thank you that was really um, a great way to bring all of this to light uh, i think one difficult thing especially that we deal with in clinic is if we believe a, a patient is frail um, and they don't have, you know, family with them or children or the resources, it's very difficult to initiate treatment, quote unquote, like getting them to social work to get, you know, support at home, getting them into an exercise program, getting them a referral for further evaluation, referring them to geriatrics clinic. All of these things, I think, theoretically, we could make a clear pathway how to get those done. Um, and I think that that would really help our patients um, do well, do better. Uh, excellent points. I think part of my plea is trying to build a, some allies to carry this thing forward. I think that that is absolutely correct, is that if you look at now, our care of the elderly is not coordinated at all. If you try to say, you know, if I, I want to get them in some exercise program, where are you going with the exercise program, you know? And then you try to decide, well, Isolation is getting to be a problem. How do you get these people? Uh, like I've got one guy that uh, is like 95 years old, still wonderful health, and his biggest thing is going every day to a family center and playing checkers. I mean, that, you think, boy, if he lost that, it would be really downhill. But I think you're right, is that we've somehow, if we're going to be effective with this, we've got to set up something that you can plug it in frailly and maybe have options, but then it's coordinated. That for you as a physician to try to do it all is... It's hard, but yeah, we need need a co effort to do that. Doug, as I was listening, and I thought this was excellent um, thought, uh, really provoked a number of thoughts. But uh, yesterday, I had uh, gone onto the Emory TED Talks and listened to 
Marshall Duke, who's a psychologist here, and uh, he talks about sort of five things towards healthy living, diet, exercise. One is uh, resilience, which ties into uh, family connections, um, having uh, friends, uh, other than just friends on Facebook, but people that you uh, communicate with, and, and actually in the, uh, I, I think in, Emory does a thing on retirement planning, and and, and they tell professors that uh, what really matters is your connections with, with other people as far as your success in retirement. And then a final thing was spirituality. Um, and I think as we deal with elderly patients and also with their families and, um, and, and, and the stress that it puts on younger family members who are, are trying to honor the independence of their father or mother, but also getting them to exercise, do a variety of things. There's a lot of struggles there. And then I was thinking about in our modern medicine, computer age, documentation, quality metrics, check the boxes, really, how does that fit in? I would, I would argue that, that going towards some type of depression scale with documentation is going to be something that actually interferes with our ability to connect um, with patients and their, and their families, that, that we do need training in that. Um, we need training to be looking at these things, but as physicians, we probably need to be given the autonomy to decide in that office visit what we actually find is important and what we need to spend our time with in that individual office visit, rather than being judged at each office visit as to whether we did a checklist. Um, and um, as we look at all the different quality metrics of numbers of medicines and, and what we should be doing and how we're being judged, judged by that. So that's the question I would raise to you is, on a quality perspective across the country as, as we move towards looking at more metrics, but then we also look at this issue of the sudden increase in the elderly population, do you think that our, our quality people are actually, um, how do those go together? Are we, are we actually coming to a perfect storm of a el very elderly population um, where we're becoming computer doctors uh, and having to, to, to check off boxes? Oh, I think you're right. And yeah, that's, that's what worries me is that the, the explosive part of this thing is a massive number of people that are entering this age group. And and that number is going up. The number of physicians and healthcare workers is not going up. It's going the opposite direction. And uh, you brought up the point about uh, people helping them. And, and, and the thing I was struck with, and I went through this a year ago with my, my mother, was uh, as, as elderly get there and they get frail and all, the demand on the rest of the family, or at least one person, I'll have to admit a sister of mine took the burden of that, but it took her a lot of time dealing with all the aspects that come up. And a lot of people don't have that. And then, and so what do we as a society do to try to provide to keep them isolated? And that's what I say if you look at one of those comments is that people say, well, I made them more independent. You know, we, we took them and took away from them things that they were, that they didn't have to do anymore and we made them where they could do stuff. But in making them more independent, you took away all their social connections. And that doesn't work. So, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the comments because this is what I see is that I just, I'm worried that we're going to let this thing sweep over us and not be aware of it, not be doing any planning as it's coming up. And it's coming up. I mean, it's, it's here, actually. Uh, Very good. I would mention two things that haven't been brought up. One is the the ills of polypharmacy. When you have, as you mentioned, uh, 15 chief complaints, there's a danger you will be given 15 medicines. And the other thing is the importance of sleep. I think now recent science suggesting that the brain, in fact, has a lymphatic system that clears proteins, including amyloid, and, and, and good sleep may lessen the chance of of Alzheimer's, but the intriguing thing is that system pretty much only works during sleep and not during wake state. And that, uh, well, Bob, you probably remember, was it 2013? That was 
thought to be one of the great scientific breakthroughs of the year. Mm, thank you, yeah. See? That's very good, Doug. It brings uh, to, to mind a no number of things that come up when we see people in the office. Um, I like the eyeball test for uh, frailty, although if you study it, you'll have to have one of the criteria of definitions that you showed there. But the eyeball test means a lot, especially if you walk into an older person's room late in the afternoon when they're going to have uh, some sort of surgery the next day. I think it means something. And you're looking at somebody anticipating whether or not they might need coronary bypass surgery or whatever. Frailty means a lot. Trying to decide whether or not they might be able to go through a tabber, frailty comes in. So uh, I just looked up the definition of frailty in uh, Wikipedia, and it says uh, weak and delicate. So also, uh, when a little bit, and I see patients in the clinic, I always worry about several things. I think appetite questions are important, and weight loss is important, and you always wonder whether or not you're missing. Uh, they may complain of shortness of breath, but you wonder whether or not you're missing cancer somewhere. You know, how much do you look at? Then if you look at the CBC and they're anemic, you look at the MCV and that's normal. And that takes you out of the iron deficiency category in general and puts you into the uh, myelodysplastic syndrome category or the mild ins renal insufficiency category. And uh, trying to deal with that is difficult. But if they're anemic, you can never leave that stone uncovered. Now, when you think about rehab, geography gets you. And if you're not familiar with their geography of where they live, You'll be frustrated in trying to get there because we, we really don't have, you can't plug them in around here if they live in Fitzgerald. And, uh, but, you know, really trying in those areas, you'll find that that's more available than you think. Every time I see one that I think is depressed and a family member says, she needs something for depression, it scares me because I really don't have a working knowledge of those drugs. And every time I give one, which I rarely, rarely do that. You always worry about the interaction of that with whatever else. And the bottom line of what you said also seems to me that encouraging these people to exercise is extremely important. Thank you, sir. I think that's right. One more I should say is that they have looked at in trying to assess frailty and the experienced physician as men at this game is probably just about as good of the eyeball test as they are with some of these other things. But the younger physician, there's, there's some that come in experience and intuition and all that go into it that you can't, we can't pass that down and just say anybody can come in, that we do need some kind of factors to say this indicates frailty. Any others? Thanks. With that, well, thank you a lot. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.